Good morning, and uh, thanks again, Dr. Stoddard. Uh, good morning, uh, Council uh, President Hucker et al. Uh, happy to provide an uh, a update, but a couple of items I'd like to uh, present to the Council sitting as a Board of Health as follow-up to our last Board of Health Clinic. Uh, we've made significant strides in planning for our uh, flu clinic, so I just wanted to uh, graphically demonstrate where those clinics are. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Cancer Awareness Month, uh, share some updates regarding that, then uh, give an indication of the great work that we've been doing vaccinating our uh, uh, pregnant uh, uh, woman population in the community. You know, the CDC recently uh, um, uh, sent out uh, information and notice and recommended and strongly encouraged our uh, pregnant uh, and, and uh, pregnant uh, population uh, women to uh, get vaccinated. And so we have uh, some county level, level data that really speaks to the great work that we continue to do with our vaccination strategy. And then Dr. Chris Snitchler, who is our resident uh, uh, internist and preventative medicine doc uh, from our Uniformed Services Hospital. I'm a ask him to do some research into our uh, case rates regarding pediatric uh, data uh, as we continue to plan for our pediatric uh, vaccination rollout in those uh, school age kids who are between five to 11 year old and some of the reasons why in his data he will present as to why we have not seen those um, high level of hospitalization for those uh, multi-system inflammatory disease or those respiratory illnesses that some of the neighboring hospital partners experience. And then um, Mr. Um, O'Donnell will present and give us a, a, run a rundown on our uh, COVID update, where we are, outbreak information, um, uh, as well as our pediatric planning. And so again, So we've updated our Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Service flu clinics for our HHS, DHS employees, uh, Dennis Avenue, our 1401 uh, Rockville Pike, our 401 Hungerford Drive. And we've also identified those flu clinics for the community as previously mentioned during the last Board of Health at our university at Shady Grove um, campus, our Dennis Avenue Health Center, uh, which will have a mobile uh, clinic supported by Kaiser Health. And then our community uh, clinics that will be supported uh, by MCPS at our three high schools, Kennedy High Schools, Rockville High School, and Seneca Valley High School. I encourage all to get a uh, flu shot if you're eligible, as well as uh, those indicators based on the data analysis from our EPI team, uh, which indicated that uh, deaths from flu and uh, influenza and pneumonia uh, was the seventh leading cause in Montgomery County between 2017 and 2019. That information is forthcoming in our uh, local community health uh, needs assessment uh, that we are reviewing and will publish and share with the community and council and the executive leadership as well. Again, it's Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month, uh, but I also encourage all to um, uh, to get screened for those for those breast cancer, colorectal, prostate, cervical, lung, and endometrial cancer is uh, recommended by the American Cancer Society. Uh, it is fortunate that my father, uh, uh, who, who suffered from bladder cancer, uh, had yet another screening yesterday. Unfortunately, they found uh, some carcinoma cells in his uh, sample, but the key is early detection and follow up. So I encourage all to uh, seek those uh, um, annual or elected uh, screenings based on your age appropriateness. Uh, early detection is the key. Lastly, we've done extensive work through our maternity partnership program where we vaccinated those uh, expected mothers at our uh, uh, Silver Spring Area Health Center and our uh, Up County Health Center. And I, I am pleased to say that our data uh, uh, is significant and, and presents a great rate among our uh, Latina and uh, African-American population, which we've seen and administered 
uh, vaccination. Since July, we've administered over 200 uh, vaccines, uh, complete series, uh, to our uh, pregnant population for these women who for these women who participate in these programs, about 22 percent. Uh, based on our estimate, which is above uh, the CDC's um, vaccine safety data link um, uh, analysis that our EPI team and our uh, maternal and child health team reported to me as of last week. CDC is reporting that as of May, 16.3% of pregnant women were identified through their data analysis. And through our data analysis, we reported that 22% is higher than what the CDC has reported as of May and July, respectively. And so we continue to encourage those um, unvaccinated pregnant women to um, get vaccinated to not only uh, protect themselves, but their unborn uh, child. Uh, we continue to provide information and also work with our child care providers as part of our communication and messaging to get those licensed and unlicensed uh, health care, uh, those uh, child care providers uh, to get vaccinated. And so we continue to make a concerted effort in this population as we continue to plan and prepare for our upcoming five to 11 year old vaccinations. So I'll pause now and I'll ask Dr. Snitchler if he would turn his camera on and if he has access to his PowerPoint presentation to present his data to council now sitting at the Board of Health. Uh, good morning. All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Um, as Dr. Bridgers mentioned, I'm a, I'm a Navy physician, uh, an internist, and I'm currently doing a second residency in public health and preventive medicine. And uh, along with that, I'm doing a two month rotation with the Montgomery County Public Health Department. Um, and one of the projects that I've been working on over the last several weeks there is uh, basically looking at pediatric cases and data on COVID-19 in Montgomery County. Uh, so this just as a military member who's presenting outside of the military, this is kind of a standard disclaimer that what I'm going to present is my own work, doesn't represent my university, the Navy, DOD, or U.S. government. Um, so uh, what, one of the biggest reasons that, uh, that pediatric COVID-19 is a hot topic right now is largely because of the potential for vaccine availability coming down the pipeline for the younger kids, the 5 to 11-year-old age group. And just as a quick review, I'm sure you know this, Pfizer vaccine specifically is currently available for those 12 and over um, after the 12 to 16 year old age group was added, uh, was given an emergency use authorization in May of this year. And then last week, Pfizer uh, submitted a new request for an EUA for uh, children five to 11. And this was based on their data showing looking at just over 2000 kids that in this age group that were given a low dose of the vaccine um, and they showed comparable um, antibody response to that lower dose. Uh, they'll, the FDA is likely to meet later this month to determine EUA recommendations for this younger age group. Uh, so before I present Montgomery County data, just for reference, this is nationwide CDC data based on age groups. Important things to see here this is a busy slide. I apologize for that. But uh, a tre the trend that we see is that in the most recent wave, the 65 and older um, age groups were not affected nearly as much as pr previously um, in the pandemic, whereas those in five to 15 proportionally had a higher incidence uh, during this most recent wave. So for Montgomery County, uh, here we see uh, incidents of COVID-19 over the course of the calendar year in Montgomery County. Uh, and just to note that age grouping here is different than the CDC data I just showed. So it's, uh, you know, you can't really compare the actual direct incidence numbers uh, very well, but mainly just to look at a trend. Um, but uh, the trends generally look similar to the U.S. population. Um, it's also worth noting that the younger age group here, which is five to nine, uh, was, was higher than the 10 to 14 age group during the most recent wave, although not, not dramatically so. Uh, this slide is sh showing uh, proportionally, so the proportion of all confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, that each age group made up uh, uh, 
focusing on, on pediatrics. You can see that during the most recent wave starting in July, the five to 11 group made up a higher proportion of total cases uh, compared to uh, prior in the pandemic and compared to um, other pediatric age groups. And this is generally in keeping with trends in the national population. It's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, likely at least partially explained by the lower incidence in higher risk groups and even the younger pediatric groups who have been vaccinated. Um, but it does support the idea though that focusing on this younger group uh, is now um, important for the for pandemic response. And then just to show you, you know, something else that we, we keep an eye on, uh, one, an issue that's particularly important to the health department is assessing uh, for health disparities. Um, and uh, we keep track of COVID-19 incidents stratified by race and ethnicity. Um, in general, earlier in the pandemic, there were larger uh, differences between groups. Um, in particular, Hispanic children had, uh, had quite higher incidence than um, other groups. Um, but in the most recent wave, you can see that the, the differences are still there, but uh, much less pronounced than pr uh, had been earlier on. And then finally, this uh, is looking at the, uh, showing the fairly low rates of hospitalization of children in Montgomery County with COVID-19. Overall, uh, for the whole pandemic, 1.1% of kids with COVID-19 have been hospitalized and then a month to month range of 0.0, .0 to 1.8%. That's the end of my data. Here's my references. This, this second one, if anyone's ever interested, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a really good chart that kind of fills in some of the gaps that sometimes you're not able to see with CDC data. So it's kind of a nice, uh, nice reference to have for looking at uh, what's happening with kids. Thank you, Dr. Snitchler. Um, just to add to Dr. Snitchler's comments, we have um, uh, used and um, uh, included uh, most of the information or, or, or much of the information that our uh, uniform service services um, university residents have provided over the past 20 months regarding our uh, surveillance and epidemiology data. It has been very useful as we look at our targets, as we determine the rate of incidence, as we uh, consider uh, transmission uh, uh, mitigation strategies. So thank you again for your work and our discussions. Now I ask uh, Mr. O'Donnell if you would put up the Pulse report and um, uh, do the run of the Pulse report today, uh, focusing on our um, uh, 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 vaccine strategy for our pediatric uh, 5 to 11 year olds. And, and questions were raised, yes, raised yesterday regarding uh, our data and our data analysis and use of CDC data that correlates with much of what um, the Maryland Department of Health sends us as their vaccine summary. And so I ask you in, to include some of the notes that we've received from our uh, outbreak team and our epi team in your discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bridgers. Uh, well, to start with the snapshot of where we are today, um, we have uh, seen over the last seven days, 662 cases. Our case rate is um, at just a little bit over 70 uh, cases per 100,000 for the last seven days. And our test positivity rate over the last seven days is 1.83. Uh, I know a lot of people are interested in, in what that means for uh, county protective measures, including the mask mandates. Um, as you can see on the right, the, the state has a slightly different uh, definition of transmission rates. Uh, by the state's definition, we have dipped below uh, 10 cases per 100,000 per day, um, and that puts us in the state's moderate category. But uh, the county um, mandates are, are linked to the CDC's uh, transmission rates, and the CDC's substantial transmission rate uh, includes uh, case rates that are between 50 and 99.9 .9, uh, new cases per 100,000 over seven days. Uh, we're currently with that with that 70 case per 100,000 uh, still in that substantial transmission, although it has been trending down. Um, the other part of that definition is a positivity rate between um, five and eight percent. We're clearly much lower than that, uh, but the CDC does use the higher of the two measures uh, to define your community transmission rate. Um, so I'll continue on. I know there are some of these questions that will 
we'll address as we go through uh, with relation to vaccination rates. So again, the, there's not been a huge change in vaccination rates. We um, uh, continue to inch forward. We're now at 99.1% uh, of our eligible county residents, 12 and over, having at least one dose and 90% uh, being uh, showing that they're fully vaccinated. These are based on the CDC uh, numbers. There is a difference between the CDC and Immunet numbers. Uh, as we've shared previously, Immunet is linked to uh, records that originate in um, the state of Maryland. It's the Maryland uh, system for tracking immunizations uh, because we are a county that borders uh, the District of Columbia and um, the Commonwealth of Virginia, there, were, there have been a number of individuals who have gone to those locations as well as other places outside the state of Maryland to be vaccinated. The CDC's rates track the county of residence as much as possible. Not every state uh, uh, tracks that county of residence, but in Maryland, there is a required field for every uh, vaccination that's done through the, uh, the state vaccination electronic health record, that's prep mod, uh, that does track the county of residence. Um, you know, so there, there, there is a possibility uh, I'll raise that um, the denominator in calculating these, which is the, the estimation of county residents um, based on census data, that certainly changes over time and that can affect what those rates are. Um, so it is, uh, you know, from the CDC's own admission, it is possible that, um, you know, some of these rates are, they're based on estimations of populations and, uh, and sometimes um, they can be affected by that. But um, we do use that, that CDC data because it does, it is based on the county of residents, um, not the number of people who are vaccinated uh, in a given jurisdiction, but, but where they um, self-report they reside. Uh, again, this is from the Pulse report from last Wednesday. We do expect uh, to have updates um, very soon to, to the next Pulse report, but we have shown that our vaccination rates amongst our, our ethnicities and uh, racial um, populations have, have closed as they, they have for the last several weeks. Our Black and African American populations are within 1% of our white non-Hispanic populations and vaccination rates and our Hispanic Latino populations and our Asian and Pacific Islanders continue to uh, excel at vaccination rates. These numbers again um, on the uh, y-axis are, are depressed a little bit because again, they don't include populations that either didn't report their racial or ethnic background or um, were vaccinated outside of Montgomery County. But as a uh, we are encouraged to look at this as a relative rate of where we're doing. Again, with a with a 99% um, uh, at least single vaccination rate and 90% fully vaccinated, um, we are seeing convergence of all of our groups as they're getting uh, as they're getting vaccinated. So we did we we have mentioned that uh, we've seen this in the past and this continues despite having. Um, converging uh, totals for vaccination rates amongst our ethnicities. Um, we are still seeing um, some discordance in the, the makeup of individuals who are becoming cases and who are hospitalized. And that is still disproportionately higher rates with our black non-Hispanic populations. Um, we still have concern over that and we're still encouraging all of our populations if they have not gotten their first or second dose to get those um, that, that is showing to be the, the greatest protection from uh, becoming a case or being hospitalized. Uh, we also uh, have looked at our case rates and hospitalization rates according to age. Uh, we do see higher rates at our younger populations. Our zero to nine, 10 to 19, and 20 to 29 uh, have the, the highest rates, um, perhaps not surprisingly for those younger ages as they're not vaccinated yet. Um, encouragingly, they, they do represent also though lower examples of severe illness at lower hospitalization rates. Where we see those hospitalization rates increase is with our seniors. Um, and this is again why booster shots are highly encouraged uh, for those individuals uh, who fall into those categories. Um, 
and, and they've been made available for Pfizer and we're hoping they'll be available for Moderna and J&J &J very soon. Uh, there was a question at yesterday's meeting about uh, whether we were seeing those hospitalizations in the seniors uh, be linked to specific outbreaks or uh, types of living facilities. We spoke with our disease control partners and they have not seen an increase in outbreaks at our senior facilities, our assisted living facilities. Um, and they have not seen an increase in hospitalizations linked to the outbreaks that do occur. Uh, so we, we think that this is um, fairly equally spread uh, uh, throughout that population. We do encourage all of those individuals, again, to get boosters when, they're, when they're, there's an eligible vaccine for them. So if they had Pfizer, that is currently now, um, and hopefully again for the other vaccines very, very soon. Uh, to the point of why we're, we're continuing to recommend uh, that 10% the, that of the population who is not fully vaccinated to, to continue to come out and get their vaccine, we're seeing that uh, they still make up more than half of our cases and more than 65% of our hospitalizations. So again, they're at a higher risk for, uh, for obtaining COVID and at a higher risk for having a severe outcome. So we're, we're still emphasizing that we'd like to get everyone fully vaccinated. Uh, just to go into where we are with uh, boosters, uh, as uh, we, we know that the FDA will meet on, on October 14th and October 15th, so later this week, to discuss boosters for the other two vaccines. We are hoping they will provide guidance on approval for them and that the CDC and the ACIP uh, teams will provide guidance on how to administer those. We hope that will happen extremely soon so we can get more people in to get booster shots. Uh, as has been already brought up, the pediatric vaccination updates, um, Pfizer has submitted their safety data and we the, they are scheduled to meet on October, uh, FDA is scheduled to meet on October 26th to review the data. We now know that the CDC and ACIP will be meeting November 2nd and 3rd uh, to give their review. And if it's authorized by FDA um, to review their uh, consideration for authorization and their directions for administration. So that gives us a little bit finer timetable on when we might get, uh, we might have these vaccines authorized um, for those pop for the pediatric populations. Uh, following that, um, we know that Pfizer is currently manufacturing their pediatric doses and there'll be a distribution of that supply out to um, uh, public health and community providers. Uh, there's been a lot of planning going on with our partners uh, within HHS, within MCPS, uh, and lots of um, public and private partners across the county. Uh, as we prepare for this pediatric rollout, um, the county is already working on expanding capacity and hours for, for both boosters and pediatric doses. Uh, over the past two weeks, we've moved to larger facilities in Montgomery County, um, Germantown, uh, Montgomery College, Germantown campus, uh, the East County Recreation Center, and the Silver Spring Civic Building. Um, we're continuing to increase the number of clinical staff we have on board to give these vaccines. And uh, we'll be looking at, as we move into the pediatric populations, uh, updating our hours uh, of availability to better align with parents and uh, kids being able to be available to get vaccines. We've also been talking with our, our school partners about um, potential sites. Um, and what we do is we, we continuously monitor where uh, vaccination rates are going on in the county and, um, and share those with our partners. And as we uh, move through this rollout, we'll be able to evaluate where we need to have um, where we need to have clinics in the county again to make vaccine more accessible. We have some um, ideas based on the the 12 to 15 year old rollout of how that will likely play out. Um, but again, we we have real time data on a, a daily uh, basis to update this, and we'll certainly uh, make sure that vaccine is available where our populations need them. We're also coordinating with our transportation partners. Uh, to work on additional resources, uh, both public and private, that can get people to vaccination sites, uh, people who don't have their own transportation. And we always look at uh, vaccination clinics that are, are highly accessible to uh, public transportation resources. 
we uh, have been coordinating with our pediatric practices to ensure that they can give vaccines. Uh, the CDC has reported that more than 70% of vaccine for children providers have already enrolled in receiving COVID vaccines. We've seen, um, looking at local data, we've seen uh, that, that play out here in the county, um, not only for pediatricians, family practices, and other types of providers. So we're, in, we're going to um, in, ensure that they are part of the group asking for vaccine. We know a lot of people rely on their pediatricians for uh, care for their, for their younger children. Um, we have heard some talk uh, at the national level about potentially there being an allocation for the first uh, delivery of vaccine. We don't have any specific data about it, but I do want to let the, the council know that the county is committed to ensuring that all of our partners uh, who reach all the different populations in our county have vaccine to vaccine, uh, have access to vaccine um, early on and then throughout the process. So if there does happen to be an allocation, uh, we'll work with those partners as we have throughout this process to make sure they have access to vaccine. Um, we're also coordinating communications and outreach with our um, public and private schools. Uh, we've seen during the, the 12 to 15 rollout that those communication networks that our schools have with parents was a huge factor in encouraging people and families to come out, not only of the students, but of their family members as well. Uh, we've been meeting with the uh, COVID uh, operational advisory team uh, and working with those, with those partners throughout the community uh, to identify strategies and partnerships that can help increase accessibility to vaccine. We do expect a significant demand over the initial few weeks um, that would be completely consistent with the 12 to 15 rollout um, and, and consistent with our, our county's appetite for vaccine. And so we're, we're making an emphasis to have um, as much access and move as much vaccine early on as we can, uh, anticipating that there will be a high number of people looking for vaccine. That was the, the data I have on there. Um, again, we'll be happy to answer any questions that, that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. One point that I would like to share um, with council this morning. Sean, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you, sir. And so one key point that I wanted to share with council this morning, as Mr. O'Donnell indicated, we continue to administer those uh, third uh, shots for those immunocompromised individuals who are eligible to receive a third shot of the Pfizer and the Moderna series vaccine, as well as those individuals who are eligible for the Pfizer vaccine to receive the booster shots. This is an indication of data that we received yesterday regarding county level data. We've administered 35,857 additional doses um, throughout the 215 spaces that I spoke of the last time council said as a board of health. In our three static sites, we've administered uh, 2,151 sites. So similarly, uh, it's indicative of all of those spaces, all of those partners who have been instrumental in us administering the doses, which can be attributed to our uh, high vaccination rates. So I just wanted to share this as an indication. This, these uh, data also include those individuals who have contacted uh, the local health department who are homebound and who uh, are eligible to receive uh, an additional uh, third shot or a booster, we have been supporting that effort as well. Dr. Stoddard. Yeah, so a couple things I wanna highlight about what we provided today. So um, obviously as Mr. O'Donnell alluded to uh, with the J&J &J and Moderna um, reviews occurring later this week and likely being acted on by next week, We'll have about a three week window between when those boosters are likely to be approved and when the children uh, five to 11 will be vaccinated. Uh, if you fall in the categories that are ultimately approved for the J&J &J or Moderna booster, I would certainly highly encourage you to try and get that booster in that three week period because we do know 
that the clinics for our five to 11 year olds will be extremely busy when those open up. And so it will be much more difficult to schedule uh, appointments in, in certain county clinics. Pediatricians obviously will cover a lot of it, uh, but I just want to you know give people a heads up to think about pre-planning when you're going to get your when you get your booster if you're eligible. The first three weeks will be a lot more easy to access sites before the the surge comes in from the five to eleven year olds to to the certainly to the county sites. And so we will offer some divergent opportunities to cover both those pools. But obviously, you know the first three weeks you'll be the you'll be the only game in town, as it were. And so we certainly encourage you to to get your vaccine then. Um, we can proceed into our discussion with MCPS now, Council President Hucker, or we can take questions on what's been provided so far and then and separate them out, so whatever your pleasure. Um, I got a couple colleagues in the queue. Uh, Council Member Reamer, is your question about HHS or MCPS? I'd be happy to wait for MCPS's presentation. Yeah, thanks. Council Member Katz? I, I just wanna, and, and Dr. Stoddard just mentioned it again, I, I thought that I uh, had actually understood the boosters for Moderna because <laughs> I, I uh, received Moderna through the through the county. And it, and then I got confused as to whether I could get a booster for Moderna through the county. Can I very clearly, uh, Dr. Stoddard, can I go and get a Moderna booster right now? Because I re, I I read uh, I have I'm eligible because of my age, I'm not immunocompromised. So what, what is the answer on that, please? So Moderna boosters are only approved at this point for immunocompromised uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. The review that will occur later this week will presumably identify, my, my sense of this is, and this is Dr. Stoddard for doc prognosticating, which is always a dangerous uh, proposition. I'll ask you what is, the number is gonna be tomorrow too. Exactly. Yeah. I would guess they're likely to approve a similar scheme to what was approved for the Pfizer vaccine for Moderna for older adults, as well as those in high risk jobs. Just reading the tea leaves, I think that's, they're likely to be a very similar pattern to what was approved for the Pfizer vaccine. But so, that will not occur until next week for those so immunocompromised, yes, now you can get one right now. Age and occupation have to wait and probably until, my guess is middle, end of next week. All right, and when it is available, then we should uh, um, get an appointment or should we just go there? How does that work? So uh, the county, I, I'll let Dr. Bridgers chime on this. So, so obviously there'll be a number of opportunities where you can get vaccinated. You can get vaccinated through your, your typically your primary from care provider habit, Pharmacies, uh, grocery store pharmacies, um, uh, the county will obviously be operating clinics. Will ha they'll have vaccine there available, and uh, depending on the opportunity, you either will want to make an appointment or you'll be able to walk up. It'll just vary by appointment. So for the county sites, I'll let Dr. Bridgers talk about what we're doing right now in terms of. I think many of them will walk up, but I want to make sure that I'm accurate on saying that. Thank you, sure, thank you Dr. Stoddard. And I see Dr. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell has his hand uh, emphatically raised, but it is just that we are we are welcoming uh, uh, walk-up appointments, but we strongly encourage um, appointments for not only to ensure that we have uh, ample supply of vaccines at our particular site based on the series of dose, but also to make sure that we don't have the extended lines, the crowds, et cetera. So, Walk-in, uh, council member Katz will be, walk-up appointments will be uh, honored. However, we ask for individuals to go online and schedule an appointment. On our website, we also have, um, I believe, and I haven't pulled it up uh, this morning, those categories for those individuals who are eligible to receive either a third shot for immunocompromised uh, individuals, as Dr. Stoddard indicated, for the Pfizer series and for the Moderna series as well as those individuals who are eligible to receive uh, 18 years and older who are eligible to see the Pfizer series booster. So therein is the distinction. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes, I just wanted to, to add to that. Um, there may be a, a slight distinction between the third dose of Moderna for immunocompromised and a booster shot for Moderna for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that is that Moderna has submitted to the FDA uh, that their booster dosage would be half of the full dosage. The immunocompromised third dose is a, is a full dose of Moderna and the booster may be a half dose. We'll, we'll see when the FDA reviews it and the CDC reviews it. So there may be a slight difference um, between those two things. And again, the reason we, we would encourage appointments is 
now with so many sites that have vaccine, uh, certainly we we would hope that people don't have to wait in line uh, to, to get that vaccine. So we encourage it, but we will uh, allow people to walk up at our sites. And also uh, my last question, Mr. President, on the flu clinics, does a person need a, uh, for the county flu cl clinics, does a person need an appointment for that? No, we're accepting walk-ups uh, regarding that. Although again, council member Katz, there is a portal for information portal online that has appointments. The key for having appointments is to manage the crowds, long lines and to limit any wait time. So we are again, um, uh, honoring appointments and walk-ups, et cetera. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank I thank you and I turn it back to you. Uh, thank you. Let me, uh, I'm trying to bifurcate my questions too to allow HHS to respond uh, uh, to any fresh questions before we move on to MCPS. Um, you all, and I, sorry, if, you, if you've addressed this, I'm getting barraged with text this morning, but um, I was gonna ask how you're working together to plan and implement the rollout for five to 11 year olds. And you explained that in your partnership with community organizations. You may have said this, but is there a target for getting a certain percentage of five to 11 year olds vaccinated within the first month or weeks? Uh, what I'll say is, I expect, a, because I expect a high number of people to come out in the first week, um, I, I'd like the county to be able to, the county and private providers to be able to uh, to vaccinate 25 to 30% each of the first two weeks. I think we can expect to see that many come out. Um, and that's what we're, we're working towards, a capacity uh, that would get us there. The state has, has shared with its um, local partners their estimations of capacity and um, their their estimation is that we can do that. Um, I, I believe that their estimation is is under what we can actually do uh, based on based on history and the direction we're going. So, so they underestimate you. Good. Okay. So twenty five to thirty percent within the first few weeks is that what's a few three weeks? Um, well, I, I would I, I, I'm hoping that we can we can do twenty five to thirty percent each week over the first okay. weeks to to meet that demand. Um, Based 25 on to 30 percent of the eligible five to 11 year olds each week. So right. that'll be a shrinking number, but a consistent percentage. Right. What we what we wow, saw great. is a huge percentage of people came out in the first week on the 12 to 15 year olds. And then it it slowly trailed off. And, and that was not only Montgomery County, that actually was the whole state that had a very similar response. So I think we can expect to see that. This is a welcome amount of specificity. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, I would only uh, one uh, council president. One point I would raise. Right, so we, we talked about this a little bit. But I'll, I'm not want to make sure the public understands this. So the the new doses of Pfizer that are targeted for the uh, for, for young people will come in a new bottle with new labeling, etc. So we'll, it'll it'll be every dose that we have of Pfizer before will not be what we're being told is not going to be usable for all your younger people currently. Not so usable for like the younger the younger population. So the, the current adult dosing bottles material that we have will be distinct from what we are provided for the five to 11 year olds. So it will, and obviously our goal in every case is when we're given an allotment to get that allotment out the door as fast as possible. But we, it is in some ways incumbent upon what the federal government provides to the state and what the state then provides to us. So I think we're, we're planning for 25 to 30% per week, as, as Mr. O'Donnell said, but I want to make sure that we understand that because we won't be able to use any of the existing supply of Pfizer that we we or the state currently has, it will be dependent on how much of that new um, labeled uh, Pfizer vaccine that is provided to us by the federal government. And Council President Hucker, just to add to that, uh, when you when you reference um, or Mr. O'Donnell's reference to extensive uh, conversations with our community partners, we have had um, extensive conversations with our community partners regarding their uh, capacity to uh, receive uh, doses directly um, by establishing uh, an identification number in Immunet so that they can get doses directly sent to them as opposed to in previous incidences or cases where we've had to transfer doses uh, to them to support their vaccination efforts. This will make significant uh, strides in our uh, safety net uh, um, uh, clinics where we know uh, the community, they are trusted agents to the community. Mm. Also, just to add to that, conversations have been extensively and ongoing with our MCPS and our private school partners regarding those uh, accessible points. Mr. O'Donnell mentioned an equity framework. An equity framework is at the center 
of our planning and it is essential to us effectively getting these shots in those uh, uh, five to 11 year olds. And we continue to look at that. Lastly, the Maryland Department of Health, uh, I will be sitting in a meeting tomorrow with the other health officers. The guidance is uh, scheduled to be sent to uh, Governor Hogan by this weekend, a draft guidance. We don't know what that guidance will look like, um, if it will be a similar uh, uh, variance of doses and allocations sent to those uh, jurisdictions based on their population. So we're planning for that as well as the contingency to make sure that we get those doses on Monday or Tuesday, we're able to uh, begin our vaccinations upon receipt. And so that's part of the planning process and provides a little more detail with uh, part of our plans. You're still not getting any insight from MDH or the governor's staff about what the draft guidance is? Not yet. It's, it's right. scheduled, to my understanding, to be sent. Uh, the Maryland Department of Health is scheduled to send their vaccination guidance for providers to the governor by Friday. Do you, well, I mean, you used to be the health officer for Calvert County and you have contacts all over the state. Are your colleagues in other states, in other counties, getting the draft guidance? Nobody has the guidance yet. That's what we will be talking about tomorrow at the health officer round, right. round table regarding yeah. the guidance for that. And so once I, once I know, um, uh, then I will share it um, with our county officials. However, that guidance will be, and Dr. Stoddard and Mr. O'Donnell had had this conversation last week, I believe, whether or not it will be population based, whether or not the vaccines will be, um, there is some indication that um, a majority or bulk of the vac uh, vaccines will be sent to um, uh, provider clinics. And we don't know yet. So rather than generalize or say, um, we are not waiting for the guidance, but we are right. planning for multiple contingencies based on the guidance. So once we receive the vaccines, we will be ready to deploy the vaccines in that population. Okay. I ask, of course, because only earlier during the pandemic, of course, we were not receiving the same information from the governor's office. Right. It was being withheld from us, but not from other large counties. Right. Um, we, I think, uh, got to 50% of our 12 to 15 year olds within the first 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. So you're predicting a lower percentage than that, but you'll catch up within the first couple of weeks or so. This is a much bigger population too, I think. Right. Like point to recognize. So 5 to 11, is, yes. Yeah, 5 to 11 is 105,000. I think it was about 60,000. So we did about the same 20, 25 to 30,000 doses in the first week for the older population. It's just a bigger percentage of that total population. Is there any prediction on how long it will take the governor to approve the draft guidance? No, I'm not sure, but absent of having the guidance, whenever it's approved, we will be ready to administer the vaccines as we've done before with the with the third shots and most recently with the boosters. And so that's our, that's why we have had multiple conversations. We've also um, are in the process of, of querying the community to see whether or not individuals who are eligible or if, if parents will take uh, their children to uh, to provider clinics, pharmacies, hospitals, our local uh, our local static sites, or other grocery stores, et cetera. So we are trying to gauge the community interest, and again goes back to our extensive conversations. And we appreciate all of the support that we've uh, that we've received from all of our minority health initiative partners, yeah. our community partners, uh, et cetera. Thank you. Yes, we all we all appreciate their hard work greatly. Um, my my last question sounds like an education question, but don't be fooled. It's really to be addressed to HHS. I watched the Board of Ed um, uh, meeting last week, as everyone should, and I was surprised to see something I hadn't seen in a very long time. The three MCPS unions, MCEA representing the teachers, um, McCap representing principals, SEIU 500 representing uh, really everyone else, um, before the Board of Education, and they, they, they have very different um, cohorts of membership, as you know, but they said one thing in common, which is that their instructional and their administrative staff is stretched to the limit, beyond the limit, because they're assigned now to conduct public health duties that they thought HHS was conducting, especially contact tracing, and that all the free time and planning time that they were counting on when they took the job is now being taken up doing contact tracing, which they thought is HHS's job. So I don't know whose job it is. I, 
I would, I would, that, that seems reasonable to me, but I wanted you to have the opportunity to address that because it sounds, I mean, they say they're at the breaking point. They say we're going to lose teachers and other educators and administrative staff. Um, they say they have stretched teams that were already understaffed and have lost educational time over the last eight months, 18 months, and they don't want to be um, spending their planning time and break time focused on contact tracing. Um, I'm wondering if HHS has added, added the staffing necessary to relieve MCPS staff of those kind of duty, duties. Um, I, well, that, I guess that's the main question. Thank you. Good morning, so I'll, President I'll, Neffel, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Mr. DeAndrea. You Would it be okay for me to support. jump in? Sure, I just thought it, this was, I, I, I can wait to your section, but really is HHS, has HHS responded to this need? Because I heard from your employees that they're doing HHS's work. Dr. Bridgers? Sure, sure. We can I'll, come back I'll, to I'll, this too, but- Sure, I'll chime have? in, but thank yeah. you, Mr. DeAndrea, for turning on your camera to show the collaborative effort that we've had. We've had multiple conversations, even over the weekend, looking at uh, 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 adding additional staff to not only help with a rapid testing, um, uh, model that has made significant strides to lessen our quarantine numbers in our uh, uh, MCPS school system. So we so we have begun to identify staff to support that effort, as well as future efforts with our test to stay model that Dr. Stoddard and I will be uh, presenting to uh, MDH um, hopefully today for their recommendation and consideration so that we can start to deploy that model. Uh, as a reminder to all, the test to stay model is a modified version of quarantine to keep those uh, students who are asymptomatic in the classroom if they've had a close contact. And so that's a, a general summary of that model. But we Thanks. continue to use that and add staff to support that. So we're looking at those schools that we've received and that we've been communicated by Ms. Glick, our school health administrator, and Mr. DeAndrea and his team as those uh, schools that may have been stressed and have staffing. So we have those in the hopper to in uh, waves or in, 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 in groups, if you will, so that we can build up to the capacity to handle not only our, our testing, but also our uh, contact tracing. Right. So that's I'm, the, I'm sorry, that's the long just, answer. The short answer is yes. <laughs> you, sorry, just to clarify, I think you said you were, uh, were beginning to identify the staff and then later you said you were continuing to add the staff how many no, staff we've identified already... the staff. We've identified the staff. They've been How... onboarded in the first group. We deployed them yesterday to support oh, those schools. So okay. we continue to, Just to do how that many staff? in groups. Uh, I believe it was up to 17. 30. It was uh, 17 yesterday, oh, okay. five more tomorrow. I just talked okay. to Ms. Glick. Sorry, um, Dr. Stoddard. 17 yesterday and how many tomorrow? Five more tomorrow and more coming on Thursday and Friday as well. How many more Thursday and Friday? I don't know. Okay. We had hoped to have 50 by the end of this week, but honestly, it was 24 we're supposed to start as of Sunday night. 17 showed up at school. This is a contracting agency where they're not our employees. Yeah. Um, so we are dealing with with that as a consequence, and so and we continue to add to those numbers yeah. as they on as they bring those staff in. We get on board. They go through the background investigations, and we can deploy them in the schools. Okay. Well, yeah. I wish we weren't in this position, but this will be a relief to our education staff, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I would say- Will they also be offering flu shots as well as vaccines? Not at this time. Is there a plan to move in that direction? Well, we have our community level schools and so we are able to follow up with our school-based health and wellness to that would be the uh, likely points to administer those flu shots. Yeah, I want to, Council President, I want to take a few things here. Number one, we've been hemorrhaging school health staff for months, um, and we can't hire. We've obviously had open recruitment um, for for the same for more than that, and so it is incredibly difficult to hire um, clinical staff of any kind, CNAs, RNs, right. any of the kind. Right. And so, um, you, and this I, is not, I, just, this I know is not, you're going to move on to an important. I just I don't want to because yeah. you've said that in other briefings, and I just don't want us to lose that point. What what could we be doing to stop the hemorrhaging of losing school health staff? Because that's really a critical thing. I just don't want us to gloss over that. We've got to we've got us we've got to conduct a study of the of the positions to to allow us to frankly change the compensation model. Let's do see, we do I mean, exit frankly, interviews? What's that? Do we do exit interviews? 
I won't. I won't. I won't know the answer to that question. I can certainly find it out. Is there a market um, a market survey of salaries and benefits? That's that's what that that is what is be that's what we're working on conducting right now. Um, but but honestly, this is a you hospitals are understaffed right now. We can talk about that as a whole separate issue. I'm sure I'm sure we will. Uh, it, it's been. I mean, we we've, we've burned our healthcare system out over the last 20 months. Uh, Based on some really, you know, bad policy decisions at the federal, you know, at the federal level over time, but also just, you know, you know, not dealing with this pandemic the way that we should have, and so we've just, you know, eroded our healthcare system writ large, and we're experiencing that people getting out of nursing entirely, retiring early. Right. The, the nursing, the nursing population is is already uh, typically skews older, uh, and, and and that that's a pre-pandemic thing, and so many people are just getting out of the getting out of the business altogether. Uh, and then obviously, then, then there's, you know, certainly private sector can very quickly change their scale, salary scales to allow for uh, increased compensation to allow them to compete better. Uh, and you can, typically, right. Yeah, then we can. So right. all those things, this is, this is a, this is a, this is an issue we're going to have to deal with both for COVID-19 but beyond, frankly, and um, very I interesting the, engagement council on that. The whole county government and MCPS are affected by what economists are calling the great resignation now following right. the recession. Right. Um, uh, Council Member Friedson. Thank you. I, I think we need to have a much longer, detailed, specific conversation just on that very point, because I think we could talk about it for a, a full briefing. And I don't think it's unique to Montgomery County. I, I don't want to you know, cast blame here, but right. it's a crisis and it is a, a broad health care crisis and something that is devastating to the county, to the school system, to our kids. And we've got to figure out solutions about how to address it, given the fact that it's a, a really tough uh, situation. But I, I won't harp on that, although I have a lot of follow-ups on that. Hopefully we can continue to, to, to have that uh, conversation. Just wanted a uh, couple follow-up questions, Dr. Stoddard. Uh, you'd mentioned the capacity uh, and the change in, in the dosage. Several weeks ago, the thought process was, we were going to repurpose, you know, like a pharmacist does, repurpose the dosage. You know, this dosage is one third. The, you know, the smaller children dosage is expected to be 10%. If it's ultimately approved, then you could just do a smaller dosage and we could handle that, uh, you know, appropriately uh, with licensed professionals uh, here in the health department and in clinics around uh, the county and hospitals around the county. Today, you shared news that that is not, in fact, what is uh, going to work uh, for, for us based on federal guidelines. They're going to have to be completely separate and labeled differently, presumably to protect against dosage mistakes and, 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 and problems. But that does create a challenge for us because one of the thought processes was the second that it got approved, we were sitting on you know, vaccine dosages in the health department and in uh, you know, private uh, healthcare providers throughout the county, and we could be ready to go as soon as the green light was offered. Now we have to wait for the, the doses. So I, I just wanted to clarify based on that, because I think it was a really important point that is new as of today for us, at least, uh, you know, perhaps not, not, not for you. Uh, what, what's the expectation based off of that? If the meeting is expected to be, uh, I believe it was November 2nd and 3rd, uh, to you know, perhaps get the approval. That would be the earliest that that would come. How long would we expect then to get the doses and then actually be able to start getting the shots in arms for the five to eleven year olds? I think we all anticipate that it will come. If we'll have doses to us, either that you know at that point or 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 even before that point, and they'll just be not approved for use until the the authorization comes. Uh, what we've been told is that, I think Mr. Adon was alluding to this, is that there may actually be an allocation that either the state has been given a heads up about. We certainly haven't heard about it. But but I think the key that we're trying to understand is, and this is a really important point. So if they do a if they do a per capita distribution to to Montgomery County, that would be inclusive of our of our presumably inclusive of our of our um, pediatricians and pharmacies. And so whatever allocation the county government would receive would be a subset, some portion of our per capita allotment, because the other portions of that per capita allotment will go to the direct pediatricians and other providers. And so obviously we are the social safety net for those people who don't have, have access to a pediatrician or who, who can't conveniently access one of those opportunities. So we're looking to set up things in advance of that. But I, 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 I 
we're hoping to find out the answer to your question about when it'll arrive before. And I, I don't know that we know it until the plan for the state has been approved. So just to add, Dr. Stoddard, and thank you, Council Member Friesen, for that. I'm looking at my notes that I printed out this morning from the local cadence call that the state has with all of its uh, principal sections. And so they are anticipating that the vials will be, uh, that the vaccines are expected to be uh, 10 dose vials with uh, 10 vials a pack. And so again, looking at their guidance, we don't know if it's population based, if it will be based on uh, what we've previously received, uh, but we're planning for that. And as I indicated to council president Hucker, we're looking at uh, multiple contingencies so that we can get the, the shots out as soon as possible. With the previous guidance, we received our weekly allotments usually on Monday evenings or Tuesday mornings, and we began administering that. So upon receipt, we plan to be ready to administer those doses. But again, the variants we aren't aware of, we don't know, we're still waiting for those decisions. So however we receive it, we have those contingency operations in place. Lastly, one difference for in our contingency planning that we did not have before when we received the vaccines, we had to receive them and transfer them out. We've worked extensively this round in our planning processes from lessons learned to uh, assess and query our pediatric as well as our safety net providers that Dr. Stoddard indicated to have access directly to Immunet so that they can get doses directly to them, which we hope will not subtract from the doses that we get from our community allotment. So that's part of our framework and planning. Just wanted to share that as part of uh, what we have contingency, uh, what part of our contingency planning for this round? Well, it's obviously great news. We heard earlier 70% of uh, uh, providers for children have signed up already. So they'll be part of this effort. You've got the partnership that you're working on with uh, community partners that you've built over the last 20 months, but we've got two or three weeks. And I think our county leadership needs to work together here and figure out how we talk to the state, talk to the governor, talk to our legislative leaders to make sure that we know exactly what we're going to get and when so that we can be prepared for it. Because the 25 to 30% that was noted, which would be great, and I think is very doable based on the 50% in about 10 days, if I recall, and, and the council president uh, noted that we did for, you know, admittedly a smaller group, but that was because we had the doses. That's because the, the doses weren't different. So we were ready to go. And, and, you have been saying, and we have been echoing the idea that if we have the doses, we can get shots into arms. And so we've got to have the doses in order to, to do that. We, we know that there's going to be significant demand based on the fact that we're the highest vaccinated jurisdiction in the country uh, for those over 300,000 highest in the region, highest in the, the state, uh, but we need the doses uh, to happen. So uh, that's a, a, a carry on from this conversation uh, as we move forward. And we got to do it now because if we wait until the approval happens it will be too late to prepare and to get the message out to residents of, of, of where they can go uh, and how to do it and i think the answer to the equity uh, issues are making sure that our health department is that social safety net and can provide it and can work with community partners and can be uh, in the most accessible places possible uh, but also that other people who have greater access can go to their doctor and you know won't be uh, you know uh, competing uh, you know so to speak that everybody will have access in a way that makes sense for, for them and their family. That's how we get everybody uh, to be safe and don't leave uh, everybody behind. So let us know what we can do. We're all here to help and support, and I think we need to start having those conversations now beyond just the health department. I think it needs to be political uh, conversations with elected and appointed uh, officials as well. So please deploy us as you will. Just a uh, last question and comment. There's a lot of confusion related to the indoor mask mandate, the CDC guidelines, and what it's based off of. Not because of anything that the county has done, but largely because the CDC has frequently changed what their standards uh, are, just in how they calculate uh, the number. It used to be the number that people uh, looked at based on 10 we wanted to be below 10. We had gone above 10. That was an average over the course of seven days. It's now, uh, uh, you know, changed. And now we want to be below 50, you know, which, which is a different uh, calculation. But this is 
it's confusing for for us. It is particularly confusing for uh, for residents, and I I don't think that we have made this very clear uh, in our public communications. And so I think we really need to improve that. Uh, I don't think we've made it clear in English. I think we certainly haven't made it clear in all the other languages that it has to be uh, clear in to make sure that every resident understands you know, what the rules are and why uh, we're doing that and how it's based on the CDC guidelines. We didn't make this stuff up. Uh, we're following the public health guidance at the federal level. Uh, but on the website, um, if you go to it, we do have the two key indicators that are the basis of our uh, our indoor mask mandate, the cases per 100,000 over the past seven days, which is currently at 70.8%, and then the test positivity rate. Uh, but it doesn't explain why that matters. And you know, I think that that needs to be highlighted. It needs to be uh, at, at the top. That is the only county-specific regulation that is in place, the indoor mask mandate. And so I think we can do some work to, to highlight that uh, better. And even if you go down to the county surveillance with the different indicators, the Montgomery County reopening indicators, uh, the language uh, refers to past reopening standards and not to the indoor mask mandate where we are. So uh, just wanted to note that if we could be much clearer, have something easy to, for all of us to, to point to, uh, obviously most people don't go to our website, but it would at least be nice to be able to have a clear place on the website that explains this and clear upfront language for, for everybody to be using. And then we have to be much more proactive with that, what the rules are, why they are where they are, when we expect, you know, you know, you know, where the trend lines uh, are going and, and, and what they're based off of, be much more proactive, make sure that it's in multiple languages so that we're reaching the diverse community uh, that we have uh, in, in the county. So um, it was a question in the form of a statement or a statement in the form of a question, but I just wanted yes, to so. note that and uh, I hope I have your commitment to, to work on that. Yes, thank you, Council Member Fritz. And we will uh, make sure we have the information regarding test positivity, case rate, what it means, what it means regarding community level transmission. When, when you look at the website and you see moderate community level transmission versus substantial community level transmission versus where we are moving from or have moved from, which was previously a high community level transmission rate. So our team will work on that to make it clear. And the key is just very simple, very straightforward, very upfront and clear uh, to see. If you have to scroll down half of a web page to find it, you're, you're, you're going to lose a lot of residents if you're lucky enough to have them visit the website in the first place. So thanks for, for your work on that. Appreciate all your efforts. And I'll yield back to you, Ms. Fred. Thank you. Just while we're on the staffing crisis, you all have so many resources available to you. Are you what, are, what are you doing or are you sure you're doing everything we can to make sure everybody at the Welcome Back Center, the Latino Health Initiative, the African American Health Program, the Asian American Health Initiative, the state's Medical Reserve Corps, that all those individuals know that we have positions available today in HHS working with our students. Yes, we've we've shared the, the healthcare uh, human resource need with our community partners, as well as our, our uh, minority health initiative partners. Uh, going back to the previous comment at the beginning of the school year, we've added we added 40 additional brokers to support our school health services and our school health room tech. We found out that that just wasn't enough, as Dr. Starter indicated, to a high turnover and attrition rate. And so we continue to assess that in ad. We've uh, sent out multiple recruitment notices as well as information on various uh, job search engines. And so we are doing that and we continue to do that and we will advise you as more support is needed. Great. Thank you. Council Member Nevado. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the team that is assembled here today. I think that that data point of having Montgomery County having 99.1% of eligible residents receive at least one dose is pretty extraordinary. And um, we need to really be grateful to the to our residents for constantly um, you know, standing up, but also to our employees who worked so hard to get us here and our community partners who have also worked collaboratively employing extraordinary best practices. This is, this is no joke. Um, this, this is quite an accomplishment. So I think the credit um, needs to be uh, extended. And I am really also very grateful to this body that has worked collaboratively with 
the administration in order to get us to this point. Um, I also wanted to chime in a little bit on this issue of staffing because uh, under the leadership of Councilmember Rice and Councilmember Albornoz, we've had joint sessions with the HHS Committee and the Education and Culture Committee to discuss this issue. This is not new, um, which really speaks to the fact that you know we, we've been very fortunate that we have um, strengthened our capacity in so many particular areas. This has been a, a stubborn area. It's been it's been real persistent. And as Dr. Sauter said and Dr. Bridgers, you know, this pandemic really, really, truly has created a crisis. I mean, I have personally received texts from 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 nurses that I know um, in a couple of hospitals who are at their breaking point um, because they are having now to work, you know, much longer hours, um, and it's just so taxing. Uh, and um, and then when we even talk about cultural pr proficiency, you know, in language capacity, I mean, of course, it gets even worse. So I just wanted to, you know, let my colleagues know that the joint HHS and Education and Culture Committee uh, have had conversations about this. Um, that you know, GO also has had conversations about this vis-a-vis -vis what we can do with HR, et cetera. But there's no doubt that I think we need to. Um, put a pin <laughs> on this issue in terms of, you know, coming together and being a lot more forceful. WorkSource Montgomery plays a role. You know, the Welcome Back Center was mentioned. I mean, we do need to address the immediate crises, but then be much more strategic with growing our own and providing opportunities. So I just wanted to mention that because I, I think that there have been already um, some plans put in place but there is no doubt that we cannot um, underestimate the fact that we are being affected uh, in crisis mode, as you will, especially now with the advent of these additional vaccine efforts. It, it's going to be difficult. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that, um, just to flag that for everyone and um, in our own central staff, you know, we have extraordinary analysts who have been helping us with this as well. So there's a lot of information on uh, packets, et cetera, that will point to the conversations that we had, I think as recently as like two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Council okay. Member Navarro. Just to add, I uh, appreciate all the feedback um, uh, for the support and the work that we do. We've also um, um, reviewed and, and uh, looked at other jurisdictions in the area and what they're doing regarding their healthcare needs, as you indicate, is not only in our um, school health system, but also in the healthcare industry as a whole. We even had, if you've seen some early on, some of the indicators that even the uh, health officers and administrators have um, have sought other uh, opportunities because of the burden that our response and moving into the recovery has seen. One other strategy that we've looked at, even with our rapid testing in our school system, and we've worked with state to follow up to get questions regarding all of the FATSAs and the responses that we've done, but looking at having um, our community health workers who are trusted agents in the community and who've been significant in supporting our vaccine, vaccination effort to be able to administer those rapid tests as well. So we move from having a dependency on clinical staff and having the clinical staff be able to do those things that they could do to respond to those school health needs uh, of those students and so in that regard. But again, at the end of the day, support is needed and we welcome the support. Thank you for mentioning that. You know, sometimes we talk about the minority health initiatives as if there's like this general category, but it is important to remember that under the leadership of those initiatives, which were established a long time ago, we did launch some extraordinarily targeted COVID-19 initiatives that have partners like Care for Your Health, like Mary Center, like the African American Health Fund. They have been on the ground. I mean, they are really the protagonists of this story in Montgomery County. And as you just mentioned, Dr. Bridgers, absolutely, because they're ready to step up once again to do this work. Um, and we have built, I think, an extraordinary capacity already with, of course, the network of the hubs and things like that. So. The Montgomery County story in this particular, you know, arena, I think it's very comprehensive and, and, and very robust. Um, but there is no doubt that we have to figure out as the leaders, what do we need to do to strengthen that capacity? You know, and that's what we will hope to hear from all of you is, you know, do, do we need 
more funding here? You know, what is at stake right away so that we can continue this story in, in this fashion? Um, so, so I really do appreciate it. And, and I appreciate you mentioning how other folks, you know, like health officers have sought other uh, opportunities. Yes, you know, that was the case here in Montgomery County, but, you know, the, the burnout is real. The burnout is real. And I, I will close by saying that I am almost surprised how everyone just is trying to just continue as if it's business as usual and it's not because what our employees have faced and what our community partners have faced is just the sustained, you know, trauma and, and just stress um, that cannot be underestimated. And I can only imagine, you know, how this then effect has affected our healthcare practitioners. So all of that is really important to factor in this conversation because, you know, we're not robots, like we're all human beings. This has been a really difficult time for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Council member, uh, Council Vice President Albert Noes. Thank you. I want to defer to MCPS to present because they haven't had a chance to do okay. that. Yet. I just wanted to mention quickly, um, we are working right now, and I appreciate Councilmember Novato's points about previous joint sessions we've had, which have been very productive. We are scheduling another one for the benefit of my colleagues and our uh, public at home, because this does, as Council Member Friedson and Council President Hucker mentioned, deserve a much deeper dive. Um, we were, we, this will be scheduled in November. Uh, to discuss staffing challenges, but also policy crossover, uh, as well as the position that MCPS announced uh, through Dr. Monifa McKnight uh, just a couple weeks ago about the public health officer position that they're going to be hiring and, and specifically talking about the intersection with our public health team. That's all being worked out. I have a lot of confidence in the teams, um, but this will be an opportunity for us to ask questions publicly. We, it doesn't prevent us from asking them privately, um, but this will also be a chance for us to productively uh, talk about next steps moving forward. So just wanted to highlight that. Stay tuned, uh, we'll be the first or second week of November. Great, thank you. You were the last in the HHS queue. So Jimmy, thanks for your patience. The floor is yours. Good morning, Council President Hucker and Council Members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share again this morning. Um, I do just want to um, start briefly by acknowledging um, that we have had a very positive and collaborative working relationship with DHHS and really appreciate all that they're doing um, to support our schools and ultimately being able to make sure that our schools can remain open at 100% capacity. In terms of the um, comments that were shared at the Board of Education meeting by our, the presence of our three employee associations, um, they definitely make some very valid points about the challenges that school staff are experiencing because we know that bringing all of our students back into school buildings after many had been um, completely virtual for almost 18 months um, presents a variety of challenges. And so there are a lot of different pieces that were um, alluded to in the information that they shared. Um, and I know we don't have time to go into details now, but I do just want to highlight that while contact tracing was one thing that was noted, there were other pieces that we were working to address. For example, one of the things, as you may be aware, is MCPS was one of the first school districts in the metro area have a plan to provide instruction to students when they were in quarantine. In order to provide that instruction during quarantine, though, that is something that staff are doing on top of what they would have done normally. Um, and so that is one thing that has consumed a significant amount of time for staff members outside of the classes that they typically teach. In order to address that, one of the things that we are doing and we shared at the Board of Education meeting is looking at how we can provide um, a cluster model, or especially at the elementary school level, provide that instruction because we do want to have that instruction available while students are in quarantine. Um, but I did just want to acknowledge, you know, all that DHHS is doing. We're very grateful for that. And while contact tracing was one of the things that was mentioned, um, there are other things and we are continuing to collaborate with the employee associations to think about how we can best support our staff who have done just a tremendous job um, over the past uh, six weeks as we transition students back into the building. Before I share the um, data points um, that we were asked to share just very briefly, I do also want to highlight a couple of other updates for all of you. Um, the first one is, um, as you are probably aware, one of the five points that Dr. McKnight outlined in her COVID-19 five-point plan was the creation of a COVID-19 dashboard. Um, that was being created in an effort to share the data in a more user-friendly format than just posting the community letters. As you may be aware, that dashboard was initially posted last Tuesday. Um, after it went live, it became apparent that there were some discrepancies appearing between the number of cases appearing on the dashboard and the number of cases that were reflected in the community letters that had been posted. And so as a result, we removed the dashboard temporarily 
have manually been reviewing every single letter and every single case on the dashboard to make sure that everything is perfectly aligned. That process is expected to be completed by tomorrow. And we plan to repost the dashboard um, on Thursday. I also want to just give a brief update um, in alignment with what Council uh, Vice President Albernos mentioned in terms of the medical officer that we are seeking to hire. So we have received a number of applicants at this point and are now in the initial stages of reviewing those applications. We are The next step for us will be scheduling interviews and the other steps in the selection process. And we anticipate having someone presented um, at the Board of Education meeting for appointment in early November. And we recognize that that person will play a critical role in continuing to build on our relationship with the HHS as we work together um, to ultimately keep schools safe and keep students in school. And then the last quick update before I share the data points that we were asked to share is um, one of the things that you are also aware of from Dr. McKnight's five-point COVID-19 plan is the campaign that we have been working on called Say Yes to the Test. And there is an extensive amount of work that has happened and will continue to happen to encourage families to opt in um, so that students can participate in both rapid testing if they have symptoms in school, as well as our screening testing program. And so I just want to highlight one thing that happened as a result of that effort. This past Saturday at Paint Branch High School was our Say Yes to the Test Day, um, one of many uh, community activities that we are conducting in order to increase the number of families that opt in. And so we worked with a number of community partners to host this particular event. And so there were opportunities to opt into testing, to get vaccinated, and then also to learn about school system and community resources. And at the same time, we had staff out knocking on doors, as well as posted at multiple shopping centers to distribute information about the campaign. And families have the opportunity to complete forms on paper at that time, or we give them the information if they would prefer to complete the information online. So in terms of the data points, um, I know that we have a limited amount of time, so I'll just very briefly touch base on our, uh, the data points that we have uh, asked to share. The first one is to give an update on the screening testing. And so at this point, as of this week, it's being implemented in 141 of our schools. As of last Friday, more than 28,000 tests had been administered, and of those, only 18 came back positive. And as we shared at the previous County Council meeting, this effort for screening testing is continuing to expand to all schools throughout the month of October. As you may recall, originally our plan was just to do screening testing in grades pre-K through six, um, but a decision was made as one additional effort to keep schools safe to expand this to all school levels. So throughout the remainder of October, this is expanding to all 209 of our schools. I also do want to just briefly highlight um, the data around our positive cases by week, as well as this number of students entering quarantine each week. You will notice for the last two weeks since we've had our last county council briefing, the numbers have remained relatively stable. Um, the number of students um, who have tested positive has gone down slightly. The number of staff who have tested positive has increased slightly, but on all the overall numbers are relatively consistent for the past few weeks. In terms of the number of students entering quarantine, once again, the last two weeks are reflected at the bottom of the screen. The past two weeks were both five-day weeks for students um, but that information is on the left side for your reference as well. We are continuing in alignment with the guidance that the HHS has provided not to uh, quarantine any close contacts of individuals who are just symptomatic. It is quarantining for close contacts of students who have tested positive. And so you can see the numbers have continued to remain significantly lower than they were at the beginning of the year when during the first week of the school, there were more than 2,000 students who had entered quarantine, whereas for the last two weeks, the numbers have covered between 396 and 455. And again, we are continuing to work with schools and partner with DHHS to do everything that we can to keep those numbers as low as possible and really um, making sure that at the end of the day, our goal is to keep all schools safe and students in school to the greatest degree possible. So with that, I will now turn it back over to Council President Hucker. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, that's very helpful, Council Member Reamer. Um, thank you. I, uh, I think I've actually had a lot of my questions addressed for now. Um, but let me give it a little bit of thought as we go through the queue and then I'll come back. Thank you. Sure. Council member glass. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good, good conversation this morning on a, on a variety of aspects to keeping, uh, everybody healthy and safe and making sure that uh, county government is able to provide those services, uh, to everybody. And, uh, um, 
I'm just looking at some of the notes that I was taking and some of the questions and, and similar to Council Member Reamer, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. DeAndrea's uh, comments, which have answered a, a, a bunch of mine. Uh, but I, I guess on the, the last slide that we just saw regarding the number of individuals, number of students who are uh, quarantined versus the, uh, the close contacts, can you uh, explain just a little bit more. Uh, I, I see the, uh, or I saw that the numbers have trended down to zero for, for some of the close contacts, but there are still, uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much for putting this one back up. Can you explain uh, the, the difference between those two columns once again? Absolutely, thank you very much, Council Member Glass, and I apologize, I should have gone into more detail. Um, on this particular slide. I know I had shared some at the previous meeting, um, but just to highlight the information and why the change in the right column versus the left column. So at the beginning of the school year, when you look back at the first row, um, in accordance with the HHS guidance, um, mm -hmm. students were being placed into, con into quarantine if they were close contacts of someone who had tested positive, which is reflected in the second column, or if they were close contacts of someone who had COVID-19 symptoms. And so for the first two weeks, you see numbers in both the second and the third column. At the end of the second week, there was a change in the guidance. And as a result of that, um, only students who were close contacts of students who tested positive were determined to need to quarantine. And so that's why for the last four weeks, the number in the second column or in the third column is zero all the way down. Then during the third week and going into the fourth week, the HHS mobilized very quickly to be able to implement rapid testing in all school health rooms in all 209 schools. So now if a student develops symptoms during the school day, they are with parental consent able to have a rapid test done in the health room. And if that test is positive, then the students um, will need, close contacts will need a quarantine. If the student is negative, then they're determined not to have COVID-19, although they are strongly encouraged to get a PCR test, but then we do not need a quarantine anymore. So that's why you see then another very significant drop um, between the third and fourth week. And so for the fourth, fifth, and sixth week of school, the numbers have been relatively consistent um, between approximately 350 and 450. Um, so significantly lower than, than before. Obviously, we're continuing to explore how we can get that number even lower. No, uh, I appreciate the explanation. And clearly, we all recognize the importance of in-class education uh, and how, you know, how important it is. And so uh, this, this information and this explanation is, is appreciated, recognizing the difference between a student who uh, has tested positive for COVID and another one who uh, might have sneezed or ex uh, exhibited some other ailment uh, that was not COVID, right? So, so I appreciate the, the difference there and, and taking that into action. The, the only other question I had, um, which you got in, which you explained a little bit was the process for the the medical officer and you know kind of going back to the conversation that that my colleagues were having about HHS in general one of the things that that I'll just say I, I don't know if it necessarily concerns me at this point in time but I'm going to you know raise a, a yellow flag about is you know redoubling or uh, reinventing levels of administration and quite frankly even bureaucracy where we have where the county right now is hiring for a chief medical officer uh, which our regulations require that person to be uh, an md and then at the same time you know having mcps search for a similar person who who is not required to be an md uh, maybe you can elaborate on that uh, as well but you know over the last 18 months the relationship between MCPS and HHS has been so incredibly close uh, and guidance has been uh, given to MCPS. And so now I'm curious if the hiring of this person means that there will be a formal break and that MCPS will not re rely as much on county government, uh, HHS and, and the, the, the executive team and council team. So can you explain the working relationship between this, this individual and MCPS in the county. Definitely, thank you very much, Councilmember Glass. Um, and I appreciate that you raise those points because it is really important to note, I don't anticipate there being any break in the relationship between the school system and the county government. If anything, 
I anticipate that as a result of this new position that the relationship will grow even stronger. While we have a strong relationship now and work together on, and communicate on a daily basis, I anticipate that this position will help us to do that even more effectively. And so the idea for this came as we explored what other school systems throughout the country have done. There are a number of school systems that do have a medical officer on board um, that's able to, especially with the pandemic going on, provide guidance on an ongoing basis to school staff. Um, but for us, where we have a very strong Department of Health and Human Services in Montgomery County, we anticipate this individual being the primary liaison with the Department of Health and Human Services, and then again, helping to strengthen our relationship even more than it is at this point. So we don't anticipate in any way that there being a break and in any way changing the process in terms of how we collaborate and follow the guidance that DHHS provides. Um, in terms of the requirements for the position, we have said in the job posting that someone with, that is a medical doctor, um, that that is a preferred qualification, um, but we are just now in the early stages of reviewing all of the applications, um, so I don't have numbers on you know, where we are in terms of how many um, individuals who are medical doctors have applied. Okay. Well, again, uh, I, I appreciate that explanation. And one of the things that we're always concerned about here is stovepiping uh, and creating more positions uh, that sometimes uh, create difficulties in, in the left hand communicating with the right hand. And while there have been these direct channels of communication, just want to make sure that whomever steps into this role uh, is maintaining those, those uh, conversations so that uh, we all know what is happening and that we all move forward in the same uh, same step. So so we will, uh, I'll monitor. I don't know, Dr. Starter, did you just yeah, raise I your did, hand? I, yeah. did, I did want to chime in on this. Uh, uh, first off, um, I think as Dr. Bridgers is finding out, being a health officer in the middle of a pandemic is, I know he knew this before, but it, I'm sure he's learning every day that it's hard. And so I think that having MCPS, having some internal expertise uh, I mean, frankly, and this is, and this is not a secret to anyone, there are some real, there, the powers of a health officer are quite broad in, in state law. And so I, there is no, there's no world where MCPS or any other school district could ignore the, the, the advice and recommendations of a county health officer. But where I think it would be really helpful for MCPS to have internal medical expertise is really around design and implementation of programs that are uh, medically informed, but are are aimed at servicing the school system. The school system itself is very large, so if you're if you're the health officer of Montgomery County, you've got a million fifty thousand plus residents to consider. Yes, they have overlap with the many of the you know of one hundred sixty plus thousand and twenty plus thousand staff in MCPS, but obviously setting up programs that that serve the school system are complicated in and of their themselves. And so I think where I think that would be really valuable is taking the, the, the combined uh, working together of the health officer and the medical officer from MCPS, developing, coming to consensus on good programming for MCPS, but then having that medical officer go and design the programs and do so in concert with the health officer, instead of the health officer and public health having to develop all those programs on behalf of MCPS alone. We're not, you know, we have knowledge because we have nurses in, in school health that are in the health rooms all the time, but we don't, you know, I would, I would not pretend that we're experts in the way that MCPS day in, day out is an expert in their system. And so I think, I think this, this, if designed correctly, as we described, will be an excellent addition to MCPS and to the county's overall health and safety. And so council member glass just to add i know in my discussions with uh dr kroll uh hhs welcomes the support often in research and science we look at uh how we um review and analyze data and we triangulate those data so as dr stoddard indicated you know from a from a from a school health uh standpoint their medical officer would work in concert and collaboratively with our uh, uh, health officer or our chief medical officer, as it would be, as well as our community partners, as um, Councilmember Navarro indicated, our, our care for your health, our, our mobile meds, all of our safety net, even our hospital um, um, uh, collaborators as well, so that we would continue to add to that community of practice that has got us to a successful point where we are now with our high level of vaccinations, as well as we continue to plan for our pediatric vaccinations. So it's just a, 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 a added um, string to our safety net, if you will. 
And if I could also just chime in, the Office of the Chief of Staff within MCPS has really served to help coordinate and facilitate the work among all of our offices related to COVID-19, as we are a very large school system and have a number of offices that are all handling parts of the COVID-19 response. When this individual is hired, this individual will become a part of the Office of the Chief of Staff um, to make sure that there's a seamless transition and, again, help coordinate all of the work that's happening throughout the school system and help to facilitate our working relationship with the HHS moving forward. Well, I, I appreciate hearing all of your perspectives as to why this position is needed and it sounds like it will be a, a value add. And as long as it doesn't add to any confusion uh, and everyone understands, you know, the, the org chart and the lines of communication uh, and the you know, delineation of authority, uh, I think that will be a good thing. So let's let's keep being mindful of that. And as as both medical officers are are hired. Uh, throughout our processes, I know that they, uh, we have to hope that they have that collaborative uh, relationship. They need to have that collaborative relationship for, for all of us. Uh, and uh, you will keep us posted as that process moves forward. So, so thank you for this update today. Uh, Mr. President, I yield back. Thank you, council member. Uh, this, is, this is great, everyone. Um, uh, Jimmy, did you happen to say how many on, on the say yes to the test campaign you're running, how many students have gotten consent for testing from their parents? So we are continuing to process all the information from over the weekend, but we are over 40,000. Over 40,000, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and did you have um, age and demographic breakdown or not? I do not have the age and demographic breakdown at this time, but we can have that information for our uh, next briefing. Did you describe what, what type of communication is going out to families? and whether that's being done in a culturally competent way. So there is a variety of communication going out to families in um, various formats in um, multiple languages. Um, we are very conscious of making sure that whatever communication that we send as a school system, we obviously need to make sure we are communicating um, in uh, ways that uh, align with the language preferences of our families. Absolutely. Have you, are you logging at all the concerns that you're hearing from parents about why they wouldn't want to opt in? To be tested? We have had a number of um, conversations with individual uh, parents and you know whether that's at the school level you know I'm speaking on behalf of the school system or at the school system level and are looking at ways to um, best address those uh, concerns moving forward. Absolutely. Okay and thanks for doing this at Paint Branch. Councilmember Rice. Count Chairman Rice. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to hear on a number of levels that the case uh, counts continue to go in a positive direction. And, you know, we've had a couple of spikes, uh, Dr. Bridgers, you know, with the updates, we've seen some that have been in the 100s, but we've seen them as low as, I think the last one was 23 cases, right? So, and then uh, Mr. DeAndrea in the school system, we're seeing uh, increased testing and seeing the numbers trend lower. So that's great news. Uh, and so that, that's, that's, that's positive, uh, but it also means that what we're doing is working. I wanna just make sure that folks understand and put those two pieces together uh, and not think that those things aren't just happening just because, it's because of our mask mandate. It's because of uh, the work that we continue to do and making sure that folks follow the best practices possible. It doesn't just happen in a vacuum on its own. Uh, it happens because of the great work that continues to go on. And I wanna thank uh, council member Albert Nose and um, uh, council member Navarro for highlighting the fact that we are going to have this meeting as we continue to do so uh, with our partners, with both education and HHS, as we continue to collaborate throughout this on best practices uh, and how best we move forward to make sure that we're keeping our students and administrators and staff uh, and families of those students all safe in our greater collective community. I will just say that uh, it will be important for us to be mindful that every single fall, uh, we do have spikes. And as Councilmember Glass was noting, the sniffles is, is one piece, but we do have full-blown flu outbreaks. I know my daughter had uh, the flu two years ago. And, you know, it's one of those where, again, it doesn't happen often. I mean, I, I fortunately have been getting my flu shots and didn't have the flu before uh, COVID came about. Unfortunately, didn't contract COVID, got vaccinated. But it's one of those where we are going to see those cases increase in terms of those that look similar. And so it will be imperative for us to make sure that we can delineate, which is why the testing in schools matters so much. 
And I would just like to encourage and just take this moment as we did this weekend with encouraging folks to please opt in for testing so that we can discern whether or not your child has in fact been uh, infected with COVID uh, much more serious than uh, the common flu and so that we can get them treatment and protect the rest of the greater school community. So uh, I just wanted to uh, make that little bit of a pitch uh, for folks to uh, continue to make sure that uh, they opt in for having their students tested. And then I just wanted to make one last comment. We'll talk about this in greater detail when we do have our joint uh, uh, committee meeting, uh, but it is one that deals with uh, Montgomery College. I know that the governor has reached out to community colleges throughout the state to talk about the nursing cohort. And many of you know that both my mother-in-law who works at Holy Cross as a nurse and my sister-in-law uh, who works at a nursing facility as a nurse, uh, what, what we heard about nursing shortages and nursing burnout is real. Uh, I was at dinner <laughs> with my family on uh, Saturday evening and heard it firsthand from both of them. Uh, we also had a brand new uh, transition in the software uh, that our hospitals use that happened. And that created some challenges for a lot of folks. There's so much that's going on uh, right now in the healthcare space that it is going to be imperative uh, for us to make sure uh, that those that are working even longer hours now and even under more constrained conditions have some sort of respite. And so that's going to come by creating additional pathways so that more folks can get into this field, uh, a lucrative field, uh, quite honestly, and one in which I agree with Council Member Hucker. Uh, we do need to always look at what we're looking at for pay uh, and make sure that it's commensurate with the great job that they continue to do in this space. Uh, but I will just say that for a lot of folks who may be in other kinds of career pathways, who may be unemployed at this time, I encourage you, seek out the programs at uh, Montgomery College and others and uh, give yourself another opportunity and another pathway that is going to be one that we'll need for a very, very, very long time. It's not going anywhere. Uh, nursing isn't going anywhere. The healthcare system may be changing a little bit with the infusion of technology, but the reality is we still need those people. And so, uh, you know, that's my other pitch uh, is to make sure that those of you who are out there who are thinking about different kinds of careers to go into, we encourage you to please utilize the programs that are at Montgomery College now that will be increased, uh, hopefully based on state support uh, and an overall na nationwide initiative uh, for us to really start pushing uh, to address our nursing shortage. So it's more of two kind of uh, sound bites, uh, Mr. President, more than anything else, but just wanna make sure that folks are aware and just really wanna, again, thank everybody for their continued partnership and working together. We know what the problems are uh, and I think we know how to solve them, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, it's going to take some time and it's going to take some investment. So I look forward to working with all of you on that. Thank you. Council, Council Vice President Albert Nose. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, very much appreciate the comments of my colleague, Councilmember Rice, just then. Um, just a couple questions. Uh, Dr. Bridgers, just to be clear, um, the I know we're working on the infrastructure and foundation to be able to disseminate the vaccinations to kids between 5 and 11. And I know we're working with the state on any guidance, but will there be a pre-registration process as there has been in the past? And how will families, where should they look for uh, the opportunity to pre-register their children so that they can be in the queue uh, to receive the vaccination? First question and related, I assume, but wanted to confirm as far as we know, that the other providers, um, our supermarkets and pharmacies will also be given dosages. So once again, families will have multiple options on where they can pre-register or register their children to receive the vaccination. If you can just be more clear on that, that'd be helpful. Sure, thank you, uh, Council Vice President Albernos. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, if you're still on, could you put up a plan and just walk through the registration process um, I don't have it in the queue. While you do that, I will speak to the second part of Council Vice President Albernos's question. Um, yes, we've worked with our community providers. So we're working, which is which goes back to my reference to a community level query to see whether or not 
those uh, grocery store spaces, those pharmacies, those other spaces, uh, providers in general, one will have access to the vaccine. If they have access via Immunet, that will um, significantly increase our capacity to vaccinate faster and in greater numbers. And so we're working on that level of detail now, absent of any plan from MDH, but as part of our planning and contingency operations, we've worked extensively again with our community partners and our safety net clinics to ensure that they have access to Immunet so that they can get vaccines directly again, which will increase our capacity to get more shots in arm. And so once we get our data um, responses from the survey, we can gauge and, and determine in those areas in an equitable framework, those spaces that will have either greater access or fewer access and use those as touch points to provide additional vaccine again. We don't know how the vaccine will roll out, if the guidance will be based on a population, whether or not we receive 35 doses a week and whether or not that, that, that allotment will include the distribution to our community partners who have access to Immunet. So that's an unknown right now, but we are taking all of those into consideration. And so Mr. O'Donnell, hopefully that answers your question, uh, Council uh, Vice President Albanos. It does. I guess the, the, the headline here is we don't know exactly yet, uh, we believe so, uh, and we're waiting for more information. Absolutely, absolutely, great summary. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, do you have the information queued up? All right. Uh, so just uh, to, to address first how we're getting uh, more providers onboarded, uh, we, we have added right to our vaccination page links to more inf to information uh, for those providers about how to get registered with the state. Um, right, right now, it's, uh, we've tried to simplify it. I, I could click on the, the PDF here. It gets um, much more detailed focused on what those providers need to have as far as refrigeration reporting and all of that. Um, but we we have uh, tried to simplify it. We've had communications directly with our providers going back to May uh, to get as many onboarded as possible. Again, those that are vaccine for children uh, providers already who traditionally serve the, the pediatric populations, uh, that process is a lot easier to go through, but it is a registration with the state to uh, be listed um, to have a COVID pin. And if you have a vaccine for children pin, um, again, it's, it's much easier to do. Uh, but for those providers who don't traditionally do it, they can still do it. Um, it there's just an application process with the state. Um, and again, I'll, I won't go through all of that. But what we have done is, and we've shared this previously in our reports, um, we've asked the state uh, periodically for updates on how many providers are currently giving vaccine and how many of them um, have registered to be able to give vaccine. And it's very encouraging. It's um, it's over two thirds of our, our providers who do pediatric uh, practices and um, a growing number of the, the family practices that are currently doing it, uh, currently administering vaccine already and uh, the vast majority of our, our pharmacies as well. Um, we are working on a letter that uh, we will push out through the medical society and to our providers as well, um, encouraging them and reminding them that they can sign up. Terrific. And, and for parents that are out there wanting to uh, look at pre-registering their kids, um, that obviously isn't set up yet uh, because there's a lot of pieces we have to put in place. But when can we anticipate the opportunity to do that in addition to working through your own pediatric provider and the pharmacies and the other networks, when, when will the county have its pre-registration process set up? We are, we're still looking into uh, how we'll roll that out. It's obviously, it's a little bit different with um, the, the much larger number of providers that have uh, the ability to give out vaccine as opposed to um, previous uses of the pre-registration list where, again, there was, there was really a very limited supply at the time and a very limited number of places you could go. So we had to make a much more extensive use of that, that process. 
Um, so right now we're still evaluating how to use that pre-registration list. Got it. So the, the general message for parents who are anxious, and, and I'm, I'm one of them, <laughs> full disclosure, um, is that there will be uh, a number of providers, more providers available this time. Um, and so there won't be the need, as there has been in the past for previous waves of the vaccination, for the same robust pre-registration system that we had before, because there will be many more providers. And as we have more information on exactly the number of providers, we will be providing information for families on where to go, how to do it, and, and, and just stand by. Uh, information will be coming, bottom line. Yes, and when we, we do link to uh, these search engines through our website. Um, so that it so that individuals know that it, it's more than just where the county sites are. Uh, in fact, when you go through the our, our website with the vaccination opportunities, um, we include a lot of those community partners uh, and the clinics that they're doing as well on our website, and um, and that's through the see available locations, dates, and times. Um, but we also have links uh, further down about clinics run by other organizations, and you can find locations near you and make appointments. And this one will take you to the Maryland page where, uh, where providers who are in the same place all the time have registered. Um, again, I don't think that every, every private provider is registered through this site, um, but in, we encourage individuals to contact your, if you have a pediatrician or a private provider, to contact them directly and, um, and, and ask them if they intend to give out vaccines <coughs> and, and how to schedule an appointment for that. Um, but this this is a great tool for looking up and and seeing um, you know where you can go to get to get a, a vaccination site and it's fairly easy to work through. Again, you can call our call center and we'll we'll help people find sites um, if they're having challenging challenges navigating uh, this website. Great, I appreciate that. Um, and then I guess just my last uh, couple of questions are. Um, comment slash question, uh, there is some evidence nationally based on uh, some of the surveys we're seeing that uh, there, there may be a little bit more reluctance from families with younger children uh, to sign their kids up as quickly as they may have for their adolescent children. Um, and so we will have to be more intentional as we have been all the way through in our messaging uh, to ensure that as the tremendous turnaround that we had with our older children, we receive the same uh, for our younger children. And so uh, just Dr. Bridgers, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what some of the plans are for those families that, you know, understandably may be a little hesitant um, to be first in line, but want to be among the first in line. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about messaging directed at those families so that we get everybody in the queue as soon as possible. Sure. Thank you again for a great question, Council Vice President Alvernos. First and foremost, we strongly encourage all parents to have their um, five to 11 year old vaccinated. We have worked and continue to work with our information to provide the best information. We've also uh, worked with our providers and raised questions about uh, pediatric uh, uh, vaccination or vaccine administration to ensure that it is a comfortable space for our five to 11 year olds to receive a vaccination, similar to going to a uh, pediatrician's office in our uh, local static sites, our high throughput sites. We've worked extensively to look at those administration techniques in our providers and our clinicians. We've provided information and resources to make sure and ensure that it is a seamless process to ease any fears that our parents have. And so we will continue to work with our communication department to have information about uh, the efficacy of the vaccine, to look at those best practices and strategies for administering the vaccinations. And so all of these conversations, these great conversations are occurring with our community partners and our providers, because again, their input is paramount. They have the information, the community level knowledge to determine and identify and direct us to those spaces where we know we should and can administer those doses. And so we're working with our clinicians to make sure that they are culturally sensitive uh, to the needs of various communities because how one provider administers a vaccine in one setting may be quite different in another setting. And so we've taken those nuances, those cultural nuances 
um, uh, into consideration. Short answer is we will make sure that our spaces are comfortable and convenient for parents to take their children to get a shot. Love it. Um, I'll save the rest of my questions for when we have that joint session in a few weeks, because um, we, we've touched on a lot of it. Uh, one of the things I will touch on that we've all described and is a deep concern for all of us is that burnout uh, and the strategies that we can utilize to provide some respite uh, for families, for the children themselves, and of course, for our providers and school staff and administrative staff. Uh, I just, the burnout rate is, is going, is very high. And, and we're all exhausted on this call, I know, um, but the folks on the front line are just really feeling it. So uh, I'll save those questions and thoughts when we have the joint session, but thank you all. This has uh, been another productive and helpful work session. Councilmember, I want to do add one piece to this, and I think it's an important thing when we talk about the five to eleven year old vaccinations. The other really, in addition to the health benefits, the other really big feature of vaccination is that when you are identified as a close contact, you do not have to quarantine if you are if you are vaccinated. And so, when we think about these school based quarantines that we are all so very concerned about for very good reason, our our most expedient way to address quarantines in schools is to get kids vaccinated when they're eligible. And so obviously that's a, that's a, I mean, if you're a parent who's a little bit on the fence, the fact that your, that your child may be, you know, have to be, have to be out of school for 10 days and you then in turn may have to be out of work to care for said child for 10 days uh, is a pretty, is a pretty significant benefit to the vaccine, even when you don't even consider the health benefits that we know. And I think uh, Dr. Snicker showed earlier the, the hospitalization things, they're not high, but they, they're a lot higher when it's your kid in the hospital. So uh, just, just think about it that way. So certainly encouraging people to get vaccinated for health benefits, but also the quarantine benefits is key. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Sauter. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Councilmember Reamer. Great uh, comment there, Dr. Stoddard. Thanks for reminding us uh, and reminding our parents that keeping their kids uh, you know, in school will be aided in a lot of different ways by getting vaccinated. I just had a quick question, probably for MCPS that may have been addressed already, but the dashboard on the internet, what's the timeline to have that functioning? Uh, it's got some data issues at this time. Yes, thank you very much, Council Member Reamer. So after it was initially posted, um, it became apparent that there were some discrepancies between the data that was appearing in the dashboard and the number of cases that were reported in the letters that are posted on the website. So it was removed. And then we've been manually reviewing every single one of the letters and every case that's currently that was in the dashboard. Um, that process is expected to be completed tomorrow. And then the dashboard will be um, reposted on Thursday. Okay, great. So coming soon. Um, I, just a very general comment. I, I have a hard time. I, I'm sure that this county is the most highly vaccinated county of our size in the country. No question. You know, we, a large share of our population works for the NIH or the N or the FDA. Um, I'm not so sure we're really 99.1%. Uh, I find it hard to square that with, for example, other data showing vaccination rates in certain census tracts as low as 50%. So, um, you know, wherever we are, I don't know exactly. I'm sure it's very high, but uh, I think maybe a little more, uh, you know, I, th I think we should not, for our own purposes, assume that actually 99% of eligible residents are vaccinated. Um, I, I just, somehow that, it just seems improbable to me. I'm sure it's a very high number, uh, but, you know, somehow that just strikes me as, again, improbable that 99% plus um, so not, not to kind of rain on a parade, but I just think if, as we are thinking about, you know, what it means and what we're doing here, you know, it, it, it's just a little bit of a different thought pattern. If you think most everybody, but not necessarily literally everybody, Dr. Stoddard, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, obviously we're, we have no reason to doubt the CDC, but I also, I, I mean, I, I think there's, when you see 99.1%, I think that, you know, if maybe that's 97, maybe it's 95, it's right. high, but it maybe there's some discrepancy there that you're right. We need to, we need to account for because we don't have the data that CDC has, you know, I, we can't possibly answer the question of, are there duplicates that they're picking up? 
I don't, we don't know that. Uh, we don't have their data set. There are about 100,000 residents who have been vaccinated, according to the CDC, that we do not have in the Maryland database because they weren't vaccinated in the state of Maryland or through a uh, part, you know, so for example, for example, if you were vaccinated at the FDA, you'd go straight up in the CDC system without going through Immunet. And so th sure. there's no way for us to know necessarily whether it's 100,000 or maybe it's actually only 40,000. And that difference is meaningful, as you said, but we just we just don't know. We, we haven't seen the line list of names that are in the CDC registry that are I generating see. that 99 so if you got one shot in one place and then you went somewhere different for a second shot and, and you know, they had to do some quick manual work to create a vac, you know, all those things could create a discrepancy. We don't really know it's possible. So I just think, you know, again, it, you think a little bit differently about it if you think maybe 90 percent or, you know, something like that. It's like, yeah, almost everybody, but it's not probably everybody. So, OK, thank you. Just appreciate that. Okay, th <clears throat> thank you, Councilmember. Um, Councilmember Friedson. <coughs> thank you. Appreciate the update. Several of my questions were asked. I won't uh, belabor them. And I do think, uh, just reiterating the point earlier, we've all heard from uh, the, the school health nurses and we've heard from school personnel and, and look forward to that ongoing conversation and to get an update on how this contracting is working since it seems like uh, that has not worked as well as we would like. And so certainly please keep us updated um, uh, on, on that as well. I, I did just uh, want to follow up. I appreciate that the data dashboard is going to be uh, uh, put up. I had heard earlier Thursday, I know uh, Councilmember Reamer uh, noted that, you know, we want to get it right, but we want to make sure we have it. We've also heard some concerns that the medical officer um, description had been taken down. I understand you're going through the interview process and you have a plan to uh, come to the Board of Education, as you've uh, noted uh, in November. I think it would be helpful for residents to know what you're looking for, even if you don't have a candidate yet, and even if you're not seeking applications, if you keep the description uh, for that uh, up and available, just so everybody understands uh, what that position is expected uh, to do. So I just wanted to note that. I think it was taken down. I understand why normally when you have a job posting and it's no longer available, you take it down, but there's such community interest in this beyond applicants for what this individual is going to do, what the scope of responsibilities uh, are going to be. I think it would be helpful to the public if, if that was uh, publicly available. Thank you, Council Member Fritz, and we can definitely um, put that on the website. It was not taken down for any other reason that the position posting expired after the I get it. It's probably, understand. yeah, standard protocol job is no longer posted, but I do think uh, it would it would just be helpful in, in the interest of, of uh, understanding, given how much uh, of, of an uh, issue this is for, for residents and how it largely was something that uh, stakeholders had requested and that you have tried to uh, follow through on, I think, which we all appreciate. So that would be that would be really helpful. And just in, in terms of the numbers, I just want to note for, for all of us, whether it's the county numbers or uh, the CDC numbers, none of these numbers are perfect. I just think we have to be, acknowledge that and, and, and realize that we're basing our numbers based off of population, which is always going to be an inexact science. I think the key here is the trends and, you know, to really understand, you know, where we are uh, in reference uh, to where we were, where we believe uh, we need to be to be consistent with the numbers that we've used. That's why I acknowledged earlier, the CDC numbers have been challenging because they have changed the way they've calculated it, which I think has really caused more confusion than it's solved and has made it very difficult for us uh, here at the local level to, to follow the moving target. But uh, you know, I, I do think uh, the, the, the larger point of us being careful how much we are focused on it, I mean, it is true to say we're the most vaccinated place uh, you know, among eligible uh, people most uh, fully vaccinated for, for large jurisdictions. That is true exactly if that number is 99.1% or if it's a little bit lower, a little bit higher, it, 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 it's still true and it still is an acknowledgement of how our residents have stepped up. And uh, I strongly believe that when five to 11 become eligible, uh, that that will continue like it did when 12 to 15 became eligible. And frankly, we're our most efficient group uh, getting uh, vaccinated. And that was true 
you know, uh, across the uh, population and, and across the county. So I look forward to that being true. Just final question uh, on this, and it relates to both HHS and to the school system. I know we're, we're talking about community uh, 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 sites and community partners uh, in the schools. Uh, could you just uh, give us uh, an, an update of, uh, you know, what the thought process is for the number of sites that you would be looking at uh, once five to eleven uh, becomes available, and how you're approaching, uh, you know, those questions and those issues. You know, where those sites would be, how many sites you would expect to have, how much staffing would be required, and who would be staffing them. So, thank you, Council Member Friedson, for that. Um, I can't go into any detail right now because it's in progress. We've identified. We want to make sure that they are equitable and accessible. We wanna make sure that they are on transportation routes or walkable or bikeable routes. We even had some considerations regarding those particular spaces uh, of schools that we've used in the past. So we haven't finalized those details. So that's why I can't give any specific schools as whether or not we're going back to Paint Branch or you know um, another school. We're working on that now. One thing that I can say in my communications with, um, with the Maryland Department of Health is that we will not be going into every school and administering or setting up a pod at over 209 school sites. That's just not practical based on the resource challenges that we currently have. And so we're looking at those schools where one, we see um, lower vaccination rates, we see access and equity challenges as we've done before with the previous sites. And we use and we're using some some of the lessons learned from our uh, 12 to 15 year old vaccination strategies that we have as far as the, the schools and the lessons learned and the impact and the ease and the staffing that we've used for that. So I can share that with you now regarding the planning for that and subsequent conversations as we get closer, perhaps on the next Board of Health um, update to council, we will have the schools identified and we can delineate those schools and the staffing their resource needs for them. We, we have identified a number of places to do the vaccination. It's just how many of them get used will in part be dependent on how much we get of the total share that's given to Montgomery County. So if we get a bigger share, we'll do we'll do more sites. But if there are more community sites, we'll we'll intrinsically just do fewer county sites because we won't have number one the vaccine to distribute, but there will be so many other opportunities in the same area. And so when we talk about an equitable distribution strategy, we're gonna be looking at the overlay of where pediatricians uh, uh, grocery stores, other pharmacies are, and who has access to the vaccine based on Immunet, and then placing our larger clinics in the context of those um, those sites. And so we've identified a, a, a staffing number for, for, for different sites, a number of different sites already. It's a matter of how many of those sites will get utilized. And, and to be clear, it's not just the public schools that we're thinking about. We are looking at the larger non-public schools as well, because they're just as entitled to receive the vaccine as anyone else is. And so we're gonna look at large sites that are geographic in nature that can serve non-public and public school students at the same time in those places. So I think Dr. Bridges is exactly right. We next meet on the uh, 26th with you all. I would guess by then that we will have a much more specific uh, um, locations, even times and, and, and weekend, all, all that kind of stuff. I think will be a much better place to talk about uh, two weeks from now, just because the state will have, at that point, presumably given us some information about what we're likely to see. Appreciate it. As soon as you can provide that to us, I think it would be helpful. And I just strongly encourage a combination of large sites and you know mobile and pop-up sites and that they be uh, distributed. I mean, we have learned very quickly that the easier and more accessible we make this, the, the more uh, culturally confident we make it, the the better adoption we get. So, you know, we know what works. We've seen what works. You all have been doing, you know, a really good job and uh, hopefully you'll uh, continue to do that. And if, you know, there could be a hybrid strategy that does both the large permanent sites and then, you know, has flexibility on moving the site so that we can make sure that we're getting into every uh, community to the greatest extent possible. I think that will go a long way to, to hitting the goals, both that initial surge of 25 to 30 percent over the first two weeks, uh, but then also the, the, the balance of uh, those who are eligible that uh, may not be running to get this right when it comes out, wherever it is, uh, and we need to go closer to them based on you know, obstacles that they may face in order to get it. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman President. 
just to add again and to, re and to reiterate our our uh, community partners will be instrumental in having that capacity to be in mobile spaces, static sites, fixed sites, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all the council members who wanted to speak. I very much appreciate all your hard work uh, on at HHS and MCPS. Uh, we're looking forward to future updates and very grateful for your partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stay safe and get a flu shot, everyone.